In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly King, Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, present everywhere and filling all things, treasury of blessings and giver of life, come dwell within us and cleanse us of every stain, and, O good one, save our souls. Hey there. Um, tomorrow, Sunday, is the 25th day of Tishri. It is uh, the 6th Sunday of Luke and the 17th Sunday after Pentecost. I think I got that right this time. And um, it's Pig Sunday, which I gather is a seminarian's inside joke for the gospel of uh, the Gerasene demoniac with the swine. Uh, uh, I am legion, and he cast him into the swine, and the swines jump in the lake. Um, it's been a rough couple of weeks for me, and um, after confession tonight, all I could, it, um, what I tweeted once was the unbearable lightness of absolution. Uh, the grace of the second baptism, it's just amazingly overwhelming, and then I came home to find this gospel waiting for me to meditate on for tomorrow. Um, I promised a brief explanation about why I use the Hebrew calendar uh, on my vlog. And, uh, well, I'll be frank, it's neither old calendar or new calendar. It's a calendar that nobody can argue with, and it's a troll because there's a certain number of uh, ortho bros on the internet that think any contamination by Judaism is bad. And so I don't mind dating my vlogs in Hebrew dates. Tomorrow, well, tonight after sunset, it's the 25th day of Tishri in the Hebrew calendar. Um, and I'm a bit of a calendar nerd. I wouldn't care if I was using the Shire Reckoning, or the Hindu calendar. Um, it's just neither Gregorian <coughs> nor Julian, and I don't feel like getting into that discussion. Um, human dates are entirely arbitrary, and Hebrew dates no less than anything else. At the time that our Lord was alive on the earth, um, the Jews did not use a fixed calendar as they do now. Uh, they were just coming in contact, uh, well, not just, but had been in contact with cultures who used fixed calendars. But, for example, the, the Jewish calendar at the time of our Lord was based on um, the date of Passover, much like our calendar is date, based on the date of Pascha. But the date of Passover was calculated not on a set of calendar prescriptions, but rather on when barley ripened. Because on the second day of Passover, a barley offering had to be offered, and therefore the barley had to be ripe enough to be offered on the second day of Passover. So uh, when spring came, the Hebrew word in uh, the Hebrew word for spring is aviv, as in tel aviv. Um, aviv is also the word for ripened barley. So a certain percentage of barley in the field had to reach aviv before it was spring, and then the next full moon was Passover. Um, and so that could be any time in what we now think of as spring. Um, the rabbis would go looking for a certain percentage of grain in the state of Aviv and then would say the next full moon will be Passover. Uh, this was actually the source of the conflict for Christians who, uh, at first being all Jews and then later including a goodly number of Gentiles, uh, kind of fluctuated between uh, the fixed calendar of the Greco-Roman secular world, if you will, and the Jewish calendar, which was in incredibly flexible. 
And uh, they, what do you do if you're a Christian community made up entirely of Gentiles in the British Isles, for example? Um, whose grain do you go by? Or do you wait for Jerusalem to tell you? And that was actually a point of controversy in the early church. And so the dating of Pascha on the Roman, Greco-Roman calendar, uh, moved from that flexible date of Passover onto what we now know as the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox. The vernal equinox was not a thing on the Jewish calendar. And in fact, I, I don't think the Jews switched over to a fixed calendar until um, between the 2nd and 4th century AD. And so uh, the calendar that we think of today as the Jewish calendar, Jesus didn't know. Um, just a little point of interest and something to think about the next time you hear the story of the loaves and fishes and you realize that the boy has barley loaves and that it's before Passover. So that means he's eating the last bit of the sacrifice, or not sacrifice, he's eating the last bit of the grain from the year before. He's only got five loaves and two fishes and the loaves are all being made from barley from last year because this year's barley is not yet ripe. Um, just something to think about. Anyway, mild digression. Uh, pigs. Pigs. Um, as I said, uh, coming from confession, you know, the, the root of every sin is pride. And no matter what sin one might be struggling with and no matter what sin uh, habitual sin or passion one carries around anger lust um, addictions whatever the root of all sin is pride and how is this so uh, because it says I know what's best for me and God does not I will do what I want not what God wants that is the root of all sin. And this makes perfect sense because all sin comes from following after the evil one whose primary sin is, I am like God, pride. But that is never the only sin. Pride is never the only sin. And as we uncover what holds us down, what holds us back, um, it is not just pride, which is the deep root that needs to be drug out by the fasting and prayer and humility that God gives us, but all the fruit of that root are legion, like the demons in the gospel story today, tomorrow. The, the fruit of pride is legion. And there's never just one sin. You know, a, a common story that I hear and a common story that priests tell is uh, how people come to confession over and over with the same sins. You know, ultimately at the root of them all is pride. But... Getting to that, uh, cutting through the different layers of the onion of sin to get to the root which goes deep is a process that can take a lifetime. The saints get through it and move on, but, you know, the St. Mary of Egypt um, found herself at the age of 80, still struggling with lust, whose root is pride and can only be undone by humility. Um, it's, it's only God's grace that lets us dance 
through weeding our garden. Um, it's only God's grace that lets us find ways through his mercy to uproot this evil vine that's growing in us. And it's only by God's grace, if you'll pardon me for continuing to mix imagery, that these demons get cast out into the swine. Uh, one thing that interests me about this gospel, of course, is the swine, because this proves that we're in Gentile territory. No Jews would be keeping pigs. And, uh, and the pigs are important to the economy of this town, which proves that it's a Gentile town. And so here's Jesus not working in a Jewish context, but working in a Gentile context. And swine, of course, are the are a major image in Judaism for unkosher. And if you know about the the rules of kashrut, the rules of kosherness for food, um, an animal to be kosher must chew the cud, um, as a cow does, but also must have uh, cloven hooves. And a pig has cloven hooves, but does not chew the cud. And uh, so the rabbis saw in a pig a perfect example of someone who looks righteous on the outside, but is not righteous on the inside. The pig waves its cloven hooves at you, say the rabbis, until you think, oh, I can eat you. And it's only later that you discover it's not kosher at all on the inside. And so here's thousands of pigs, thousands of righteous people who appear righteous on the outside but are not righteous on the inside, led to ruin by the casting of demons out of this one sinner. And there's, there's something there for us to think about, something there for us to realize when we sin, we damn others around us. And uh, when we sin, when, when, one, when I sin in the first person, my sin can lead others through my pride to their downfall. And um, think about the sex scandals that have been striking the Catholic Church, certainly, but other religious communities to a smaller degree. Um, uh, Bishop Barron calls the sex scandal the perfect demonic plot because it wrecks our faith in the establishment of the church, but it also wrecks our faith in the sacraments of the church, and it also wrecks our faith ultimately in the faith, in God. Why would a loving God allow this to happen? And um, I, I don't have an answer for that. Uh, but I do know, as I said, that these sex scandals are happening in other religious communities as well as in, within the Roman Catholic Church. Um, and that the cover-ups that go on in the Catholic Church have been going on in other religious communities as well. But the sin itself the demon cast out, made public, can bring down thousands of others around us. It, this gospel is so perfect for us these days because we make our lives, uh, certainly as I have done, we make our lives public on the internet. And just the purging of our own sins in an in a way causes scandal to others the epistle today uh, is uh, saint paul urging generosity and it's an interesting spin because the prosperity gospel people take this to mean if you a charitable donor, give me a grifting preacher five dollars, 
God will give you $20. Not me. I won't give you $20. But if you give me $5, somehow God will give you $20. Um, because God will repay your generosity with his own generosity. That's not what this epistle says. What this epistle says is that we as a Christian community take care of each other and as long as I am, as long as I am, and as long as you are, and as long as we all are cheerfully taking care of each other, then all of our needs will be met by God's grace working through us. Not, I'll get rich by giving away my money. And when, when you read it that way, when you read it to say, it is our continual bountiful giving of ourselves to our neighbors, and their continual bountiful giving of themselves to their brothers and sisters in Christ as well. The gospel overflows with gener or the epistle, I should say, overflows with generosity lived out in our lives. And that's the exact opposite of the pigs. Yes, I know Jesus did the exorcism and the, the demons left the man and went into the pigs. But I am I, I want us to see these in tandem in the epistle Paul urges us to generosity and in the gospel the evil within the one demoniac is suddenly cast out into thousands of others and we can do that in our pride when we inflict our internal demons on others as opposed to when we give generously from love within us to those around us. Amen. It is truly meet to bless you, the Theotokos, ever blessed and most blameless, and the mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim and beyond compare, more glorious than the seraphim. Without corruption you give birth to God the Word. Truly the Theotokos, we magnify you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.